because it's time to start. It is now 24. We are one minute to start. It was expected for 9.25. I would like to welcome all of you. I will stop now this. And the music, I don't know if you are hearing a music. It's from my computer. Adrilli, good morning, Giovanni. Good morning, good morning. We don't have the moderator at the moment. I don't know what could happen to Oliver. Yesterday he was online, I've seen him. Anyway, welcome to the second day of the Skillman International Forum, the 11th of December, 2020. We are celebrating the annual meeting of the Skillman Network with uh, uh, several uh, friends from uh, several different countries in the world. We are very happy about this uh, uh, differentiated uh, territorial differenti uh, differentiated participation to our annual meeting. We have the contribution of uh, very important for us experts and outstanding experts in their own field um, they represent the best of the research or the, in this case, the research or the practitioners that were also yesterday on stage. Our members today will try to understand your point of view, experts, on the uh, skills for 21st century. You have been uh, asked to try to answer to our curiosity to know what your studies um, concludes at the end of the 2020 when the pandemic uh, is afflicting our societies and uh, they are curious to know what you suggest for a vision uh, for the future that uh, integrate uh, the thought about the skills and the current uh, situation. So you are not uh, uh, easily asked to illustrate your work, but you have also uh, to support our members in understanding your opinion about the future. That is something very difficult at the moment, always, but in this moment particularly, I think is even more difficult because we are facing uh, for um, a situation that was never happened in our societies before, if we don't go back in several years to find the similar situations, but not installed in such um, organizations of the life that we have now, where we are used to travel, to fly to another count, in other countries, to have uh, several exchanges across countries and so on. So, all this is uh, now a new challenge for us, for education and for TVET in particular. We all are interested to reinforce our networking activities and to use even uh, distance connections to continue our collaboration. Now on the plate, all these things uh, we have uh, um, Professor John Flynn that was expected as a first speaker, but uh, uh, from uh, Australia. I don't know, John uh, is not connected, uh, I suppose. So I would like to skip and to wait for John uh, uh, when he will be connected to uh, Professor Ulf Daniel Hellertz. Uh, uh, is a professor uh, in Germany, um, is a... Uh, um, is a leader of a team that uh, make uh, analysis about the skills uh, for the future. This, the, the work that uh, Professor Ulf uh, uh, Daniel uh, drives are very uh, significant for our uh, network because uh, as we discussed yesterday, we try to make a collaboration uh, across the centers of uh, vocational excellence that belongs to our network to uh, identify the skills for the future that uh, we then move uh, 
into the curricula design and the curricula pathways. So, Mr. Ulf Daniel Ellers, this is your uh, time. You have uh, uh, around uh, 10 minutes, I suppose, or 13 minutes to uh, explain us uh, about your uh, analysis. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. And uh, Great. you have the microphone on. Please go on. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me and can view the slides as well. I have to go very quickly. I'm starting my uh, timer here, um, 10 to 12 minutes. I'm a professor of education management. I have spent my time in my life so far also as an entrepreneur in business, have founded three companies. One went bankrupt, one I still have and one I sold. I have been a vice president of my university for six years, and now I'm an ordinary, normal, full professor and do research since a couple of years. And since my field is the field of higher education and the future, I've always worked on digital transformation. We were actually asking ourselves in the last years, together with our partners, because my university, which is here, there in this uh, red spot uh, in Germany, in the southwest, near the border of France, my university has uh, 6,000, 6, uh, what we call them, dual partners, which are companies. Uh, and our students are alternating um, every three months between uh, both locations, the university and the partners uh, practice study. And what we see in the development together with them is that there is a huge, huge change in skill structure. And you know about that already. Um, I've made a, made a graph here, which is not ready yet. It's in a, an emerging graph, an emerging thought, which I share with you. I had it this morning when I went running uh, and uh, I shared very freshly with you. Um, this actually expresses the changing structure of our skill um, ecosystem. Um, in businesses, um, we have uh, several segments of skills, which we know. You know that telecommunication providers, for example, they need to print 45 million uh, um, uh, bills uh, every year in Germany, for example. And this is nothing where you want to have design thinking skills. This is something where you want to perform standard tasks in a standard, excellent way without any mistakes, um, but you don't need to invent the, the wheel uh, every, every day new in this uh, field. So these are standard tasks and uh, we, used in, we used to have, um, and that was our competitive advantage, we used to know about these standard tasks very well and they were occupying a large space also in our businesses, in our business processes. Then we also have another segment where we need different skills. Uh, I call this what we expect but don't exactly know these are the projects we are working on, the new stuff, so to speak, yeah? the new markets, the, the new projects, the innovation we are turning towards and we, we, we work with. And for this, we, we, we really need skills um, to invent things, yeah? to, to design things. Yeah? It's not just knowledge, it's about knowledge transfer, knowledge application to transfer one solution of one particular problem to another particular problem area. This is a skill which you need here as well. You also need a spirit. You also need um, to be aligned with the value and the culture of the organization where you are in. So that's a bit more demanding and a bit more contextualized. You cannot easily transfer a person from one company in the tech or finance field in this area here who's working on a new market into a different company with a totally different culture and values, uh, there is a big adaption to do. Whereas in the lower segment, you can interchange and exchange. The lower segment is also the segment we expect in the next 10 years to be uh, subs substituted, substituted uh, by uh, IT technology, artificial intelligence, robots, et cetera, uh, more and more. This middle segment, um, uh, not so much. And then there is a new segment, which is the emerging futures. And you know that emergence, emergence is a concept which basically means that a system is changing its, uh, its uh, situation, it's changing its status. The system, a system is, is a business system, a market, for example, or a societal 
uh, which a society with, which is in a certain stability is changing its its um, composition, is changing its status without an unforeseen, without a without a foreseeable external uh, stimulus. Yeah, that that's emergence. That's how the physicians and the biologists define emergence, a concept coming from these disciplines. So that's emergence. That means basically you, you cannot understand tomorrow by knowing the past, yesterday, okay? So you need new thinking, yeah? That's the emerging futures. And in our societies, I mean, the pandemic is one good example, uh, but also climate crisis, uh, hunger, peace, populism, there, there are lots of examples which you can draw in here, which are rising more and more, which become more and more important, more and more urgent, more and more um, feelable, perceivable in everyday life also, yeah? So um, these emerging futures are those futures where you cannot prepare people for, yeah? You cannot really prepare them in the usual way we think to prepare our graduates in universities or higher vet by uh, uh, defining curricula and uh, by analyzing typical tasks of the job markets we are wanting to prepare them for, yeah? And the idea, the idea of future skills, which we in our research group since five years now are actually promoting, the idea of future skills is that we see that this middle and this upper segment are becoming more important. They are widening their scope. That's what this uh, rectangle is uh, meaning, yeah? From going like that to going like that. They're widening in scope. And that has a repercussion and a consequence for the way we think about education, yeah? That because if this is the situation, we need more and more graduates and people prepared for dealing with an unforeseeable future or with an unknown future. And um, quickly going, going ahead, we think that we need a new master narrative. That's what we call a new master narrative uh, for higher education. That we are focusing most on higher education and higher, higher vet, on, on uh, higher vet and higher education in our research. Um, there are beautiful models which also explain this, but I don't go into depths into this, but if you are interested, look into that, the race between technology and education uh, by Harvard professors Goldin and Katz, um, or the model of the next society by Dirk Becker, which uh, has to be written with an AE actually, I just see on the slide. Um, uh, sociology, uh, the, the model of emergence, and then, of course, the, the attempt to operationalize this uh, with the concept of VUCA. VUCA means volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, complexity, to, to really try to operationalize this idea of an unforeseeable future for our educational uh, processes, uh, really. We have tried then to set up a big research project and it's not finished yet. So we are four years in the, on our way now. We have conducted several studies, qualitative interview studies. We have conducted a screening with about 150 um, uh, organizations, big ones, small ones from the public and from the corporate world. Um, and we wanted to find those organizations which we thought were very, very futuristic in their, their very advanced in their thinking um, of uh, competencies and human resources. Uh, and we set up an expert panel and we invited companies to contribute their concepts. They did that largely. I mean, that was quite a success. There were 150 companies and organizations uh, contributing and taking part in this exercise. And then we selected 25, the 25 most advanced. They came from all different kinds of fields, from healthcare, from kindergartens, from uh, consulting, from um, technology, field of technology. Also big ones like, uh, like uh, Hewlett Packard, for example, was in the, in the sample and so on, but also very small ones and unknown ones. Um, and we went into these companies and we asked them, Please, three questions. Three, please tell us what is the future skill your uh, members of your organizations need in order to drive your organization towards this future? What, not what are the standard skills which you need, but what is this upper segment, this future skills which they really need and which they might not have today, but which you see they need? 
The second question was, what do you do to support them? What are good models? What are working models uh, to, to educate them, to take them on board, to coach them, to support them in this direction? And the third question was the question, what do you expect of higher education and education in general um, to, be, um, to, to do actually, to, to educate uh, those people, to use the time they are with you in education um, uh, and in vocational education and training in higher education um, and to educate them. So this was the question. Um, uh, we also did a big Delphi study and another big Delphi study um, and um, uh, all the knowledge, the entire uh, future skill model <clears throat> can be found on nextskills.org, can be downloaded for each of the 17 skills. We have one fact sheet, it's a one pager. You can download it in German and English, it's all open access. Um, we have also done a video uh, portal where we uh, put 10 short videos, one and a half minutes for individual uh, separate aspects. Um, we've written books and published books in March this year. Uh, they have been downloaded 160,000 times uh, by uh, today. Um, uh, the uh, uh, main book is this book, Future Skills in English uh, and in German it's translated. Um, okay, and let me tell you a little bit about the future skills for the last minute now. Um, we have defined 17 future skill profiles. There are, let's say, standard, which, which everybody knows already, like learning literacy uh, is one, reflection competence is another one. There are also a bit more difficult, which we know, but we do not really educate in higher education today. Decision competence, taking responsibility, perspective taking, also ethical competence. And then competences which deal with um, inventing alternative futures, futures like these uh, competence like design thinking competence, ambiguity competence, um, innovation competence, and sense making. Sense making uh, as an important uh, issue. We've designed, designed now a future skill finder. That's where we are now today. You can go there and explore these skills and download fact sheets for these skills. Uh, and now we're going back to higher education and we are trying to find models. That's the um, task for research currently conducted. Um, we have some PhDs working on this issue, uh, some European projects working on this issue, also on skills for blockchains. <clears throat> now I have to stop. Uh, and um, that's where we are today. I invite you to go. I quickly fast forward some of the slides. The slides will be uh, sent to you, made available. So that's why I put a little bit more there. Um, and uh, you can find this also on the portal, which I told you about. Uh, and I come to the end. Um, and thank you very much for your um, attention. This is my last slide. Um, invite you to go to the portal and have a look yourself, explore what's on there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ulf. Now we are going to uh, disactivate all the microphones. I think also mine will be off. And, I... and now is my own and uh, uh, the moderator that is not uh, me with the, it's uh, Emiliano will open the microphones uh, requested. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ulf Ehlers. Um, I was uh, fascinated by your uh, presentation when we met a few weeks ago about uh, the volume of your uh, activities and researches and the quality. I think that uh, it's very important uh, for us uh, to have this uh, uh, interaction, uh, active and uh, continuous interaction with you because uh, our observatory on advanced manufacturing uh, is uh, providing only part of the skills uh, of the vision for the future skills and we need uh, to uh, keep on the uh, channel open with you to take advantages from your studies and uh, if you agree I would like to see you in a webinar in the next months uh, of the of the coming year to go deep into all the parts that you have uh, just quickly introduced us because uh, of course in 10 minutes was not possible to go uh, more in detail. 
So I'm passing now to the next uh, speaker. I think that uh, John, uh, Mr. John Flynn, is not yet uh, connected. Um, so I will skip. I uh, know I will follow the current list uh, where uh, Marieke uh, Van der Weyer is uh, our expert from SD. OSD. Your microphone is uh, now open. Marieke is uh, an aficionada. The um, in uh, Spanish is uh, um, our uh, uh, reference for our reference for uh, OSD because even last year she gave us uh, her contribution coming to the Florence uh, ev the event in Florence and uh, she's a senior policy uh, analyst in Paris, I suppose, or at least she was based there last time that we talked about this, is a senior policy analyst, and she works exactly to, in, the, in the field of skills anticipation and in the vocational education and training, training sector. Uh, we are very curious to see the evolution of your uh, studies. Uh, and thank you very much to be here, Marieke. Now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, good morning, everyone from Paris, indeed. I'm still here, uh, even uh, in this lockdown. Um, I will give you a quick overview because only have 12 minutes of uh, the recent research we have been doing at the OECD on, uh, on VET and, and, and VET facing the future, as you can see in the title. Um, so why are we looking at the future of that? Uh, I think a lot of this has already been discussed. So I'll be quite brief on this. So we all know that skill needs are changing because of several big factors that we usually call mega trends at the OECD. Uh, we know that uh, technological progress is automating certain tasks as uh, was just uh, highlighted before. We also know that a lot of new types of jobs are created often that have very different skill profiles than the ones that are being automated. And we also know, unfortunately, that many people have weak basic skills. Actually, our OECD research shows that six out of 10 adults in OECD countries still have either no computer experience at all or weak basic, uh, weak digital skills. Uh, so this is in sharp contrast with the strong demand that we see for this type of skills. At the same time, we also have, of course, population aging that changes skill needs, that changes also the training needs of adults and the green transition, for which we don't have good data, unfortunately, uh, at this moment, but we do know that it's changing production and consumption patterns. So of course, this has an impact on skill needs overall. Now, on top of all these structural changes that we've been talking about in the last couple of years, of course, the COVID-19 uh, crisis arrived uh, and has been changing everything in the last couple of months. At the same time, we can also expect that it will have longer term effects as well. It will be accelerating some of these trends Think about digitalization, for example. We have all been working remotely uh, for a few months now. I haven't been in the office since uh, since March, so we've all gotten used to this. Uh, and we all see some of the benefits of it as well. Same for online learning, for example. So these things are here to stay. And so this is accelerating some of these trends. The same for the for green transition, for example. Many countries are committing to a green recovery. So this will certainly accelerate some of these structural changes. Now, just to take a few steps back before we talk about the future, just to see what has changed in the last few decades. Uh, and this is for OECD countries. What you see here is the change in the composition of the labor uh, of, of employment. So the change in uh, the, the composition in terms of skill levels. So what we see is that in most OECD countries, middle skill jobs became less important relative to low skill, but especially high skill jobs. So most of the employment growth has been concentrated in high skilled jobs in most of the OEC countries. Uh, this is what we call job polarization. Now, a lot of this is of course explained by the fact that we see a decline of the manufacturing sector. Now, we know that there's a lot of middle skilled jobs in the manufacturing sector. Uh, so this is driven to some extent by that. But at the same time, if you look within sectors, as you see in this chart, we see that there's also polarization within almost all of the sectors. So here you see, uh, the change in the composition within a sector. And you see that in virtually all sectors in OECD, across OECD countries, there has been growth in high-skilled jobs 
whereas middle skill jobs have become less important. And you actually see that within the manufacturing sector, and most of them are at the bottom of this chart, you see strong polarization. So within manufacturing sectors, you do see this shift towards high skill employment, uh, contributing to overall job polarization in the labor market. So that's what happened in, in, the, in the last few years. And as I was saying before, we can continue to, these, to see these changes. And, and that's why VET uh, can, be, uh, can play an important role. If you think about VET uh, being able to equip people with the right skill to respond to changing skill needs, so VET can become increasingly important to address changing skill needs. Now we've done some research uh, this year on the labor market outcomes of graduates from vocational education and training. And that's what you see in this chart. So it shows you the employment rate of young adults with different types of degrees. And you can see the blue diamond, for example, shows the employment rate of graduates or young adults with a VET degree. And it's a lot higher, in fact, than those uh, who have a general education degree at the same level. And in a few countries, you also see that VET graduates actually have similar employment rates than those uh, who graduate from tertiary education. So this clearly shows that VET has a strong value in the labor market that employers appreciate or value the skills that are developed in, in vocational education. And indeed that VET can play this role in equipping students or equipping people with the right skills. Now, at the same time, we also know that, um, that VET often still today, so at the upper secondary level, prepare students for uh, jobs that are in the middle of the, the skill spectrum. So this means, for example, crafts workers, uh, assemblers, but also clerical workers. And across the OECD countries, uh, around uh, four in 10 students or, or adults with a vocational degree work in these middle skill jobs. And as I showed you before, just a few slides ago, these middle skill jobs are becoming less important. So we should think about in the future how to adapt that so that it can actually also prepare students for high skill jobs, because now we see that only 20% of adults with a VET degree work in high skill jobs. Although there's a few countries like you see here, the Netherlands, for example, the US, where there's quite a few VET graduates who work in high skill jobs. But we have to think about how to, how to adjust, adjust VET so it can prepare students for higher skill jobs, how to also develop, for example, higher VET programs as we were just hearing about in Germany as well, uh, to be able to respond to these changes. Now here's a very complicated uh, chart, I have to admit. It shows you uh, the risk of automation for different types of occupations, which are the, the bars. And the dot shows you uh, to what extent vet student or vet graduates work in these occupations. What you see here is that indeed, many of the middle skill jobs have a high risk of automation. So they will see a lot of changes in the coming years. And that in some of these occupations, indeed many vet graduates work. So you see that for example, for assemblers, you see for drivers and mobile plant operators. So many VET graduates work there and they have a high risk of automation. But it's not the case for all of the VET occupations. So if you look at the left side of the chart, you also see that uh, there are some occupations like personal care workers, but also uh, science and engineering associate professionals, where there's quite a few VET graduates who work there and there's a low risk of automation. So again, we have to reimagine uh, how well that could look like to prepare students for those safer jobs, while at the same time also thinking about how to adjust our VET programs for those more automatable jobs, because those jobs are not disappearing, they're changing. So we need to make sure that students in those fields develop the right skills and are adaptable, because we know that these jobs are changing, so we know that these people will have to adapt to new realities. These jobs are not disappearing, I want to stress that, but they're changing. So what does this mean for VETS? So there's a lot of changes going on and we've identified four different areas in which we want to do a lot of work on in the coming years uh, to re-engineer VETS or to reimagine uh, VETS to some extent. And in some countries it will be more important than others, of course. So first one is responsiveness, how to align VETS better with the labor market. This involves, of course, uh, bringing employers together as you are doing in the Skillman network uh, and making sure that their the needs are reflected in vocational programs. How to secondly also to improve the flexibility and inclusiveness. So making sure that VET is accessible to a broad range of students. And this also includes adults, because we know that adults will be in need of upskilling and reskilling because of all these changes in the labor market. And that means that VET could play a role for them as well. 
And thirdly is to support transitions. If jobs are changing, that also means that you have to adapt. And for this, you need strong basic skills, but also soft skills and increasingly so also digital skills. And finally, uh, a topic uh, that we want to look at as well is innovation, how to make VET of the best possible quality, how to make the best possible use of new technologies and new pedagogical approaches in VET. So just to highlight some of these changes also with some data, because that's, uh, that's our strong point at the OECD. So first of all, in terms of uh, responsiveness, so to what extent are employers involved in vocational education systems uh, across OECD countries? What you see here is the share of VET students who are in, uh, in programs that have a substantial work-based uh, component. And you see that across OECD countries, it's only around one in three VET students who have actually access to work-based uh, work learning. Uh, of course, big differences between countries. There are some countries like the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, Germany, where almost all students are in programs with a large work-based component. Whereas there are other countries like the Czech Republic, Greece, Italy, Japan, Korea, where all of the programs are uh, taking place in the school. So there's certainly some room for improvement to have to make sure that students have access to the workplace and develop those workplace uh, vocational skills, but also soft skills. Secondly, in terms of flexibility, so I already said it just before that adults are increasingly in need of upskilling and reskilling because of these changes. But in many countries, vocational education really focuses on those young students in initial education. If you see in this chart, for example, the share of students in VET programs who are older than the typical age, you see in some countries like uh, Turkey, Chile, Indonesia as well, for example, there's very few VET students who are, in, uh, who are older than the typical age. Whereas in countries as Australia and New Zealand, it's very common for vet students to be a bit older than the usual age. Of course, if you want uh, adults to participate in vocational education, these programs need to be flexible. They need to be, for example, organized in a modular way. They have to be available part-time in the evening, for example. There needs to be recognition of prior learning, just to make sure that we overcome the barriers that many adults are facing when it comes to training. The third aspect that I just mentioned is uh, to facilitate transitions later in life. And for this, we need strong transversal skills. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about transversal skills and the extent to which adults have transversal skills. But we do have a survey at the OECD which measures the literacy, proficiency, and the numeracy proficiency of adults. And here we plotted again these literacy levels for the different uh, for adults with different education levels. So what we see is that those who have a vocational degree have lower literacy levels than those who have a degree at the same level, but with a general orientation. Now, there might be many reasons for this. It could be the case that in vocational education you have limited access to literacy skills uh, courses. That's uh, one possibility. Could also be that the weaker students enter vocational education. And it could also be that those who graduate from vocational education no longer invest in their literacy skills. So there's many reasons for this, but it's all quite problematic, I would say, because we have to make sure that everyone has a strong level of foundational skills to be able to be adaptable. Now, the second type of, of, of uh, trans transitions that we should look at is transitions into further education. You know, we know in, in many countries, actually, VET is still considered as uh, a dead end. So there's no options for further education. Now, what this chart shows you is the, the share of students enrolled in programs, in VET programs, that give access to higher education and those who do not give direct access to higher education. And the good news is that in many countries, VET graduates can actually directly go into higher education, theoretically at least. But we need to make sure that in practice, this also happens, that students have sufficient support to do so, but also that there are programs like, for example, was mentioned in Germany, higher VET programs where students can continue their VET uh, studies. Now, the last point in terms of innovation and in terms of, of technological progress and pedagogical approaches, um, Again, an area where we don't know much because this, this is of course what happens in the school where we have limited views on, but our survey of teachers does show that VET teachers more often than, than teachers in general education use 
uh, innovative pedagogical approaches to develop, for example, problem solving skills this is what you see in this chart here. So problem solving skills, of course, one of those transversal skills that is becoming increasingly important in the labor market and that we want students to develop in education. So while it's good news that vet teachers use this more often than others, we do see that there's still a lot of room for improvement as well. So around only half of teachers use these types of, of uh, techniques in the classroom. In terms of uh, digital skills, we see uh, many teachers using ICT in the classroom or many teachers allowing their students to use ICT in the classroom for learning uh, in the countries for which we have data. And again, vet teachers use this more often than general education teachers. But at the same time, we also see that many teachers are still struggling with, uh, with the use of ICT in the classroom. So vet teachers uh, and general education teachers need access to development opportunities themselves to make sure that they have the right digital skills. And the last point that I wanted to make here, uh, again, on technology is the use of more innovative types of technology. And unfortunately, this is absolutely an area where we don't know much at an international level. This chart is actually for the Netherlands. It's a, a very interesting research that we came across uh, in terms of the use of different types of technology in upper secondary uh, vet schools. And actually shows you some interesting patterns. So we see a lot of different types of technologies being used in vet schools in the Netherlands, with almost all schools using online learning, which is not surprising even before the, the pandemic. Uh, also many of them using uh, online learning environments, but also quite a few that, uh, that say that they use virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, very interesting. At the same time, which you don't see in this chart, but you can read it in the report, is that uh, those schools or those institutions that use more innovative technologies often limited to one or two programs, whereas the more common technologies are spread much more between the different programs and the different schools. But it's good to see that these new types of technologies are being used, and uh, I hope we can do more research on this uh, in the coming years to know also more uh, from other countries than the Netherlands. So I'll stop here, but just to highlight that these four areas in terms of responsiveness, flexibility, uh, supporting transitions and innovation uh, are the crucial ones that we have identified and in which we will be supporting countries, uh, both OECD and non-OECD on how to reform their VET systems to make them future ready, to make them more resilient and to prepare students exactly with those skills that they need in the labor market. Thank you. Good, thank you very much, uh, Marieke, for the several inputs that you gave us. <laughs> I was a little bit confused sometime with some uh, specific uh, chart that uh, you have illustrated in so short and maybe uh, require more time uh, to, to be understood uh, for the normal people like uh, me. But anyway, I have understood that uh, COVID is accelerating these mega trends that you uh, have at the base of your uh, um, reflection and uh, um, the, um, the TVET can have uh, an important role. You confirmed that uh, our work has a, a meaning <laughs> in, the, in the arena. And we are exactly here to understand where to take, uh, where are the sources uh, where we have to take our information as practitioners, practitioners but uh, the network is not only composed by practitioners, uh, uh, even by researchers like you. Anyway, for the practitioner side, uh, we know now where to go uh, to understand better in the field uh, uh, of uh, sc uh, future skills anticipation. So we have seen two clear examples on uh, um, a possible scenario. Now we are moving to the business world with uh, Cristina Del Voyeda that I have seen before that uh, she is connected. Good morning, Cristina. Uh, Cristina is uh, the leader of uh, the Innovation Center of uh, PwC, I suppose based in the Netherlands. Um, yes, yes. And uh, she's specialized in policy research in the field of high teach skills. So we had the occasion to collaborate uh, sometime in the past years 
even uh, last year, Christina was uh, with us uh, contributing to the Skillman uh, uh, Florence uh, um, Forum. And uh, I think that the part of uh, the thought and the remarks of the speakers of the, uh, the Florence Forum were then merged into the Skillman Florence Declaration. So thank you very much for your contribution. Now the floor is yours with, the, I see, the curriculum guidelines 4.0 that I'm also proud to have been the occasion to uh, contribute to the definition. Yes, thank you very much, Giovanni, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. And uh, indeed, so in my presentation, I would like to address the topic of curriculum guidelines 4.0. And that's a result of a two year initiative that we've uh, recently completed for the European Commission, uh, EAS Mendigi Grow. And uh, I think it's a nice follow up also for the presentations of the previous speakers, uh, where they extensively addressed the skill needs. And so what is it that is currently needed and demanded and is um, uh, expected to be demanded in the future uh, in terms of skills and capabilities? And um, I'm going to follow up on that in terms of how to translate it then into specific um, curriculum design and implementation. So what do we have to do with our curricula to make sure that we end up with the skills that we need? And if I can move to the next slide, then uh, indeed, uh, so this is just a brief summary of what this initiative uh, was about. And we also performed our own extensive analysis of skill needs to build on top of that. But our main purpose with this initiative was to make sure that we translate um, the identified skill needs and education and training um, um, uh, developments uh, for the manufacturing domain into specific curriculum principles and to develop um, very practical guidelines for education and training providers that could be shared. They are publicly available. You can all access them uh, via a Europa um, a website of the European Commission, uh, which would uh, equip practitioners, so education and training providers, so both uh, academic um, um, education providers, but also more industry oriented, so more practical uh, oriented, also companies themselves who are um, doing training with very practical suggestions, tips, tricks, uh, and uh, specifically strategic principles, um, what needs to be done there. And we focused actually on the whole educational trajectory. So it was broader than uh, VET. It was also covering higher education and on-the-job training. And uh, we developed it in a very close collaboration with uh, stakeholders. Uh, so with uh, representatives of, again, education and training providers, but also students students and policymakers uh, from all over Europe uh, through multiple means, including workshops, surveys, in-depth interviews. And we also presented it in, in Brussels during our final conference. And if we could move on to the next slide, please. So um, before we jump into the curriculum guidelines themselves, it's important that uh, we just have a quick review of what do we actually mean by curriculum here? And in our analysis, uh, we wanted to approach it from a broader perspective, not just from a narrow one, looking at the list of subjects to be taught, but more from a perspective of an overall learning experience of individuals and groups. So how do we need to organize the whole learning experience and cover all the dimensions that are relevant, not just subjects to be taught, in order to uh, make sure that the result that we are getting from this type of education and training is leading us exactly to those skills that uh, were highlighted also by the previous speakers that are needed for the manufacturing domain. And if we could please move on to the next slide. So this is the core framework um, for our, um, as a result of our analysis, which represents, uh, as we call it, a holistic approach towards curriculum design and implementation. 
and it shows that uh, when we talk about the transformation of education and training, and specifically given the current developments and this um, rapid uh, digitization of it, um, technology should definitely not be seen as the only element. It's by far not <laughs> the only element and sometimes may not even be the key element in the whole transformation, because this is a highly complex phenomena in itself. And it uh, consists of all kinds of dimensions, which we've highlighted here, we've identified eight of them um, and uh, they include strategy collaboration content learning environments delivery mechanisms assessment recognition and quality this framework was developed in close interaction again with um, all key stakeholder groups and we wanted to keep it very to the point and straightforward and of course each of these points can be then further opened up and uh, translated into very specific elements and we also conducted our own survey uh, to identify which of these eight dimensions um, stakeholders perceive as requiring the most significant changes at the moment. And the ones that were identified were strategy, collaboration and uh, learning environment. So these were the three elements that we had to zoom into and uh, to elaborate on what are the exact changes that are needed. When we talk about strategy, uh, we talk more about the overall approach, the overall core values, commitments, uh, resources and capabilities associated with a specific um, educational um, offer or training offer. And uh, here we can talk about things like um, offering lifelong learning or at least preparing students for these lifelong learning opportunities. So educating people from the perspective that this is just uh, one of the steps in the very long trajectory of learning that they will be getting. And so they get used to be lifelong learners. Then another point within strategy could be a big picture education so that we are not educating people from a very narrow perspective just them focusing on specific domains on their their own but we are opening it up and allowing them to see the bigger picture how their particular um, domain and what they're studying is actually related to the overall bigger picture of of the world and other domains and how they can interact with those domains and even think across domains uh, and we've seen examples of where education is um, being organized um, in, rather than around specific domains but more around topics or even societal problems so it's a totally different approach towards organizing so that's just an example of, of what the strategy could be uh, in this case uh, collaboration um, here we talk about different ways of um, new ways of collaboration and not just uh, between academia and industry which is obviously crucial for hands-on practical education but also for example collaboration with society to involve society at certain points in specific groups uh, where th there would be interaction with the community and the, the need to solve specific practical problems of the community, but also collaboration with students themselves, of course, uh, with learners uh, and engaging them, not just in the implementation of the curriculum, but also in its development and making sure that uh, their needs and their interests are also taken on board and that uh, customization and personalization of educational offer is, of course, present and making students as change agents in, in this process. And then uh, when we talk about the third dimension that I mentioned as um, perceived being perceived as highly relevant, so learning environment. So here it's uh, about what are the ideal learning environments and often these are different environments because obviously for different skill sets or types of skills you need different type of learning environment uh, that needs to be replicated. And uh, here we talk about um, uh, collective problem solving, risk taking, you know, experimental approaches, uh, um, a learning environment that stimulates creativity, that uh, stimulates uh, communication and all kinds of aspects related again. So uh, to specific skills that you want to, to be trained in that environment. 
And in our guidelines, we actually go quite in detail into each of those dimensions. And for the time's sake, of course, I cannot go into this right now, but you're warmly welcome to um, go to the um, Europa portal and uh, just find the guidelines. They are, again, available online. And there we have uh, detailed descriptions with uh, examples of best practices of institutions that already um, apply these principles in practice with specific links. Uh, so what can be done? Um, and my main message here would be, again, is that uh, when we talk about educational and training uh, transformation, we should keep in mind that we should not be too much obsessed just with technology and uh, put it at the center of the whole transformation, but we should uh, look at it from a holistic perspective and uh, keep in mind that there are all kinds of relevant elements that need to be taken on board. And of course, the ones that I haven't covered, but are still highly relevant. It's obviously content, which cannot be ignored and it's, uh, it has to be up to date and uh, represent state of the art uh, needs. Uh, delivery mechanisms, that's basically where technology comes in. So how, how do you deliver this in the best way? And uh, so here we can talk about technology enabled learning. Uh, whether it's needed and how, what would be the most appropriate way to train those specific skills, but also assessment, uh, recognition, and of course, quality. So these dimensions are all at the core of education and training transformation. And if we could please go to the next slide. Then these are some key messages with regard to digital transformation of curricula. And as um, of course we all um, can observe uh, right now, we can see this accelerated uh, digital, well, we could call it digitization of curricula, which means that the physical aspects of curricula are to a large extent being rapidly translated into a digital, digital means and digital ways of offering it uh, because of these uh, short term needs and uh, current situation. But the question is, um, do we want to go like this also in the long term? And does it really make sense to do this? Uh, and the, the answer for that can only be found if we take a few steps back and try to think what is it exactly that we want to achieve with these transformational processes. So do we want to, um, to train specific skills and what are the skills that we want to train and what are the, the best ways to train them and is digitization really the best way to achieve that result? So that these are all the questions that we need to be asking ourselves instead of just automatically you know, going with the flow and just going digitally. And again, it's important to mention, um, I'm not, um, so I, I'm uh, absolutely enthusiastic about the opportunities that are offered by technology and fully um, support um, this need to explore its potential and implement it where it's needed. Just trying to invite all of us to do it critically and assess um, whether there is a real added value when applying it uh, and how can we look for ways where it really increases effectiveness uh, rather than just you know uh, making it digital for the sake of digital and for that we need to start with again with goals and desired outcomes and um, for only from there translated back into uh, appropriate solutions so it can be good in a, in a short term, but we need to consider what's the best way to do this in the long term. And I think the answer is quite obvious. Probably it will always be a combination of uh, both physical and virtual. Uh, and uh, we just need to figure out which part is better to be digitized and which part is better to be left uh, in a physical form. And for the latter, uh, I think we should think more in the direction of uh, communication, collaboration skills, uh, problem solving skills, creativity, um, and, and so on. So these are examples of, um, of types of skills that are clearly requiring a significant uh, physical component, but these are also transversal skills. And of course, there are also technical skills, which can obviously not always be trained uh, online, but there are lots of other physical components that need to be present in the education and training processes. So these are my key takeaways um, for now, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Thank you very much. As always, uh, when we uh, discuss uh, um, your, uh, your view, we met a lot of challenges that we have in front. Uh, and uh, we have seen the academic approach uh, on future skills. Then we have seen uh, a linkage among the, the, the need of skills and the um, social uh, uh, concerns, the, the aspects for the education sector that we also touch, but is not our central focus. And then we see how to deploy our uh, mission in uh, um, designing curricula, considering the demands of the company and the technologies and um, the eight dimension that you have introduced as a guidelines for, for our COVES to uh, understand how to link the work that they do in upgrading the existing curricula to the uh, uh, needs uh, of the to the future needs of the um, of the skills. So uh, there is opportunity that we have in front, as you said, are uh, very uh, relevant, but uh, are also challenging as uh, and creating new barriers and new gap gaps. So we are uh, we have the responsibility to put all this information in our daily uh, work. Thank you very much, Christina, for all the indications. And uh, I see now connected uh, Professor John uh, Finn, and uh, I ask uh, to the director to open the microphone of Professor John Finn. Thank so you. Good morning. Uh, we are a little bit in delay, uh, <coughs> considering that your uh, mean, your presentation was expected a uh, uh, little bit uh, before, and now we have uh, already covered the time for the first session. But we will try to reduce a little bit the break and to ask to the next speakers to uh, try to arrange. But we also have uh, some time. Uh, that can be used uh, from the next session now. So, um, Professor uh, John Finn is um, our uh, uh, good friend from Australia. He's an eminent uh, uh, researcher at the RMIT University and is a professional, a professor of professional practice. Um, he has a, a conduct, conducted a study <clears throat> together with our <clears throat> senior advisor, Professor Rupert McLean, about uh, the, the skills. And uh, um, this study was conducted uh, in a case study in, uh, from Qatar. So, Professor uh, uh, John Finn, please introduce yourself. Uh, better if my presentation was not enough, uh, and then your case study. Thank you very much. You're very, very kind, Giovanni, and thank you for that introduction, and I apologize for um, confusion over the time difference between Europe and Australia. This project in Qatar was one of the first studies that have really tried to look at the place of 21st century skills in TVET. And the reason uh, for this was that the National Research Foundation, uh, Research Fund of the Qatar Foundation is concerned about the changing nature of the economy and society in Qatar and what in particular is needed for Qatar, a country which has traditionally uh, depended upon natural gas and chemical industries to have a more knowledge-based economy, to have a more sustainable economy, and particularly to be more inclusive because the number of uh, workers in the Qatar from outside of Qatar is 3 million compared to 300,000 local people. So, and there's been a lack of, to date of the 
capacity of local people to participate um, in the, the workforce and therefore they have been particularly restricted to working in the uh, public sector only rather than the um, private sector, which in many countries, of course, employs the vast majority of people. There was also a concern um, that the um, traditional values of the country be preserved and uh, that they are actually used to balance uh, approaches to develop so that there could be modernization without westernization. Um, as you know, Qatar is one of the most extreme and arid environments in the world, which is it. interesting that this then makes environmental sustainability a, uh, a, a major issue. And the uh, National Vision 2030, which underlies all development planning in the country, uh, aims to make Qatar a sustainable and inclusive Qatar. And in uh, that regard, if we go to the next slide, um, we see that this national vision um, really integrates those social and environment and economic developments. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is also um, taken seriously, we found, by the political uh, leaders in Qatar, and at the 2018 um, United Nations General Assembly in the report of the Sustainable Development Goals, Qatar said that educating its human resources or human development was critical if it was to achieve its national development strategy. I'd like to spend a little bit about time on the uh, background research that our team did before uh, coming to our uh, conclusions about 21st century skills. This helps to establish why we were able to focus upon 21st century skills as the uh, focus of Tibet reform. We began by uh, looking at what were the international and national global uh, drivers of change um, in the Qatar society, in industries and workplaces in Qatar, and the, exploring the extent to which TVED in the country was responding to those changing drivers. And we needed then to have a look at the patterns of economic growth that were changing and also were receiving government support to change even more. Qatar is a country in which the hydrocarbons and urban construction, particularly for the upcoming uh, Football World Cup in 2022, are actually um, comprise more than 90% of the entire economy. If they're going to become a more knowledge-based economy, then what industries um, re need to receive government support and therefore, how might TAFE respond? And so on the next slide, we indicated that we were looking at ways in which um, changing workplaces were leading to changing needs in TVET. And we came to see that human capital was the number one focus. And if there could be a drive towards promoting human capital, it needed to be done in such a way that it integrated the other forms of capital upon which sustainable development depends. And so it was with uh, that in mind that we started to look at what were the next slide, the major sources of skills or major types of skills that were needed to drive and respond to these economic um, drifts. And for all of us involved in um, TVET, we know that there are a, a broad, four broad clusters of, of learning that's needed. There's, not, there's first of all the need for those occupational cluster skills, 
not skills for any one particular job, but a broad range of what we will call occupational clusters. There's also a need for people to be able to deal with uncertainty and complexity in a changing world, to be able to um, move from memory and knowledge recall into higher order cognitive skills such as analysis and synthesis, evaluation, problem solving and decision making. There's also a need for um, generic skills uh, for life and employability, such as creativity, critical thinking, group work, communication, um, ITCs, and of course, uh, particularly in the context of Qatar, where there wasn't a strong tradition of it, the need to promote entrepreneurial activity. And when we started to look at, well, how might those four clusters or four categories of skills for employability to be needed, we realised that we'd seen them all before and they were in the many different taxonomies of 21st century skills um, that have been identified for primary and secondary education. And if we can see on the uh, next slide, that 21st century skills um, were something that are really quite uh, ambiguous. They're more a, a meta concept than having a set fixed definition. But uh, over a decade ago, the OECD skills and competencies that people are going to be required to be effective workers and citizens in a knowledge society of the 21st century. We found that there had been very little work putting together um, a taxonomy of 21st century skills for TVET, but there was excellent work done um, in Europe and in the United States and in a couple of countries in Asia about what were the 21st century skills for general all-round uh, education. And we were able to conduct a wide range of research activity that explored with uh, people in the education ministry, that explored with uh, through surveys and interviews, senior executives and um, human resource managers in a wide range of industry sectors, and also that explored with the um, curriculum leaders in the TAFE institutions in Qatar. And what we explored with them was, was how relevant was the idea of 21st century skills? And more importantly, what ought they be in Qatar? And how might any list of uh, 21st century skills we come up with, how relevant that might be for um, translation into a foundation for Tibet curriculum reform? And on the next slide, John, I think we are in, in delay, if you can uh, accelerate uh, the conclusions. Thank you. Yes, certainly this is the last one. Right. What we identified from the interviews and other research we undertook, four broad categories of skills, and we found that the higher order thinking skills, those technological skills and personal social skills were that were very common in um, the secondary school listings were very, very valid in Qatar and for TVET, but that in particularly in TVET in preparation for the world of work were a range of skills related to sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, but um, citizenship, both local and global, uh, cultural competence, fair-mindedness, and uh, the ability to take the perspective of others. So we're at the stage in the research where we are now field testing the validity of um, this category of 21st century skills for TVET 
by going back to the industry associations and the major employers and to government and asking them to what extent are their employees displaying those skills. We're asking the TVET folk to what extent are they including them in the curriculum and then looking to find ways in which the answers to those questions uh, can come to pass. At the moment, we've been held up in finishing this work because of COVID, but in the new year, we'll be moving into the final stage of the research, which looks at three things. Firstly, revising that list of skills. Secondly, uh, the curriculum for reform that is needed um, to help achieve the Qatar national vision of a, an inclusive, sustainable knowledge society. And finally, the exciting part, which will be to explore the relevance of these uh, TVET 21st century skills for um, usefulness and adaptation in other parts of the world. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Finn. Uh, we are very proud that our members from Australia conduce, conduct uh, uh, such important studies in uh, uh, Qatar. And uh, um, we have seen that you, uh, it's like a promise, I suppose, uh, to, come back, to come to us uh, the next year to finalize, uh, the, to make the presentation of the finalized uh, research. Uh, of course, that uh, COVID is a barrier for everybody to continue our work in the in the same uh, way. So we need uh, even to to uh, to wait uh, and to see if uh, the situation will change. Otherwise, we will have to find different ways to conduct uh, our researches and studies. Thank you very much. Uh, um, well, thank you very much indeed. And John, please uh, bring our regards to. Uh, Professor McLean, that uh, unfortunately this year uh, yes. couldn't connect uh, with us uh, for this uh, event. So now we have. Uh, um... yes, and uh... please, please, John. Now we have. Uh, no, uh, everything uh, is. There is a, a, a delay because uh, uh, John is in Australia. Please, uh, John. No, probably, uh, okay. Now we have a small uh, break that was expected for uh, 10, uh, 13. We are in big delay. I would suggest uh, not to skip the break, the, but just to reduce uh, to five minutes. For um, So this means that we can uh, start again at 10, 42 minutes. So, Please take your time, five minutes break. Thank you, Valentina.
So we can start again. We have uh, now 77 participants connected and uh, second round for the first for the second day of the Skillman International Forum 2020. We have now uh, seen uh, uh, researches in the field of uh, skills identification for the future, connection of skills with academic researchers, uh, researches, connection of skills uh, within the society, uh, societal demands. And we have uh, seen uh, also uh, the point of view of a specific country, very difficult to understand for, at least for me, uh, Qatar. And now we are moving uh, to a more, um, I think, uh, um, fresh approach uh, for the point of view of a movement that is very important in Europe, that is represented by Giovanna uh, Majostorovic, I hope to pronounce correctly, um, that represent uh, uh, the European Youth Forum. Giovanna is a medical doctor based in uh, uh, Serbia, I think, and, uh, uh, and she is very well engaged in, uh, um, in uh, the European debate, uh, as I met her in other uh, forums and I know her as a very valuable speaker that will introduce us uh, about uh, the European Youth Forum uh, position uh, about the skills development and uh, uh, what we are discussing today. Thank you, Giovanna. Please introduce yourself if my presentation was not uh, enough to understand and then your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really very honored to, to be today with you. Uh, I had the opportunity to follow the, the forum and I think it's very relevant for, for all of us. And I hope that we will uh, use some knowledge from here and uh, implement it in our future work. Uh, I have to start today while speaking about uh, COVID and um, education uh, with this slide because I think it's very relevant. Uh, in this day, the school where I graduated from, the Belgrade School of Medicine is celebrating 100 years. Uh, and the influence of this school is specifically very important in these days uh, while we are facing the COVID crisis. So in this time, I just would like to say thank you very much to all my friends, colleagues and professors, not only in Serbia, but also all over the world who are in the front line in the fight with this virus. Uh, European Youth Forum uh, is uh, recognized as a voice of young people all across Europe and we represent over 100 youth organizations which reach millions of young people across Europe. Our world is really changing very fast from a focus on the green transition to protect the planet, but also to increasing digitalization of all our lives. The pandemic has had a huge impact on our health, but also on the educational system and on people's access to employment, and we can only expect it to accelerate uh, in and expose the existing trends in digitalization. We need to make sure that young people, especially the most vulnerable groups, are ready for these changes and that can overcome the challenges of the pandemic and to gain the skills they need. Um, the ILO and OECD have identified a set of mega trends that are shaping our future of work, globalization, climate change, demographic, demographic changes and technological uh, advancements. Beyond those global trends, we also said uh, that the level of poverty among young people and youth unemployment is extremely high, showing that young people's transition from school to work are very difficult. How can we provide young people with an education and the skills that they can help them to make this transition easier? This aspect is especially important for most vulnerable groups of young people who often lack the access to education and training, face higher risk of poverty and unemployment and may not be prepared for the changing world of work. One of the key changes in the workplace is digitalization. ICT skills are likely to be required in most professions in the future um, and um, from for farming to, to banking. The European Commission estimates that 90% of jobs will require some level of digital skills. 
However, the skills necessary for the world of tomorrow have not been so sufficiently uh, taught in our uh, standard schools. Approximately 44% of European citizens do not have basic st uh, digital skills, and there is substantial shortage of ICT and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, um, workers, despite uh, the very high demand from the employers. Furthermore, young people are often assumed to be digitally naive, uh, yet, these assumptions fail to reflect the fact that not all young people have equal access to technology, nor do all young people come from the families that can afford them. In a survey of 15 countries, only 80% of young people felt that they had necessarily digital skills for the working place. Our economy also needs to be, make a green transition to protect the future of our planet. There is currently a shortage of professionals with the green skills like climate adoption, which are increasingly required for this transition. Most young people studying subjects such as civil, civil engineering, urban planning and architecture are not being taught enough how to incorporate climate patterns into their work. Despite the growing need, both of the substantial uh, substantiality of the projects, but also to reduce the harm to, to our planet. However, this should not mean that we all should work in the ITC, ICT or green field. Education remains a human right and it should seek first and foremost to provide young, people's, young people with the skills for their life. While increasing investment in digital skills is positive, this should not come at the expense of cults of the subject deems like less useful for the labor market. Instead, we need to make sure that not all young people studying different subjects are provided with the basic digital and green skills they need for the future. However, we also need to consider the types and availabilities of jobs for young people, as well as educational system. Increasingly, young people are working in low uh, quality, non-standard work. Statistics that show that one half of young people in the European Union are unemployed on a temporary basis. Non-standard uh, forms of work tend to provide worse conditions in terms of job security, earnings, but importantly, also fewer training opportunities. A changes approach is needed to, um, to ensure the better quality job opportunities for young people who are working in positions which provide training opportunities and that provide good working conditions. The impact of um, uh, COVID definitely is a huge thing for young people. We partnered for the ILO International Labour Organization on a global survey on the impact of COVID-19 on young people, which we, where we received more than 12,000 responses. The findings show that young people who were in education, the 73% of them reported having learned less since the pandemic started, and 51% believe that their education will be delayed in some sense but 9% of those fear that their education will suffer and might even fail. Students' perception of their future career prospects are bleak with 40% facing the future with uncertainty and 14% with the fear. The survey also showed that one in six young people have stopped working since, since the start of this crisis. We've learned from this pandemic that we need to prevent a digital divide that may lead to many young people falling behind in their education. We need to invest in digital facilities to make sure that all schools and students have access to digital facilities, but also so they can continue their learning and to train teachers in digital skills to ensure that they are able to effectively engage with students digitally. The impact of COVID is also going to have a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable young people, as there are many likely to be excluded from educational system and will be more likely to face unemployment and poverty. Young people are a very diverse group, and it's important to look in greater details at all of those who face greater challenges than the others. Certain marginalized groups are far more likely to, to leave school early. For example, 25% of Roma youth have no formal education compared to only 3% on non-Roma youth. Only 50% of child refugees in Europe have access to primary education and foreign-born studies are twice as likely to leave uh, school earlier than their peers. So, oh, sorry. Do you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, also, there are pupils with, well, coming from the local social economic background are almost uh, five times less likely to reach the basic level of competence in schools 
uh, from their higher social economical backgrounds. We're looking for the skills of the 21st century. Fewer young women report that they have the digital skills which are needed for the workplace compared to young men and other young people are also at risk of not having the necessary digitally skills such as young people living in rural areas or young people with disabilities. It is vital to ensure that education is inclusive and non-formal education providers are key to furthering inclusive education systems and youth organizations of course, that have a very important role to play in this by providing non-formal education, such as youth clubs and groups. Non-formal education practices have shown to be a successful tool to engage a more diverse and large group of young people, including uh, disadvantaged young people, and can help young people to gain more soft skills like confidence and social skills, in addition to uh, supporting their civic participation. Learning in a non-formal setting, and particularly in youth organization, is an integral part of inclusive education, thanks to their capacity to reach out to more vulnerable groups or young people who may not be engaged in formal education. Also, school segregation, as well as bullying and discrimination, are still a reality and remain largely unaddressed. Discrimination of all grounds must be tackled at all levels to ensure that all children and young people are able to make the most of their educational opportunities available for them. Furthermore, the development of specific policies and support is, of course, needed to address the specific barriers facing different young people, for example, language learning for young refugees and taking discrimination against young Romas. Uh, the challenging work, uh, world of work is the impact of COVID-19 actually pose significant, significant challenges for our educational and training systems. We need to ensure that all young people are equipped with the necessary skills for the changes and to identify and support those young people that are most at risk to being left uh, behind. Uh, we have some of the recommendations and I hope they will be useful. And they are the key actions that we need to do are to integrate, inter integrate into educational curriculum green and digital skills to prepare young people for the 21st century workplace. We need to identify and provide tailored support to vulnerable young people that address their individual barriers. We need to support and recognize non-formal educators such as youth organizations who are able to re reach the most vulnerable young people. We also need to invest in digital facilities and skills for teachers to make sure that no young people are left behind. We also need to promote the quality of internship, apprenticeships and other employment opportunities provided to young people to ensure that they provide decent learning opportunities and protect young people's social and unemployment rights. Uh, lastly, we also need to make sure that governments are interested in this and they are investing in continuous skills forecasting to make sure that can, we can predict which skills young people will need uh, in the future. Uh, I also think that it's quite relevant that we are all in touch and that we all share our recommendations all together in order to, to make some better change for this world and to make the education more sustainable and more useful, not only for young people, but all of us in this society. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope that we will stay in touch. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna. As uh, always, I have seen you very effective uh, with a lot of... Uh, uh, information and uh, also a lot of uh, uh, good arguments to support your uh, mission in Europe and in the world. I noted uh, this uh, very strong commitment to include the green and digital skills as a, a value for the curricula of the future. And uh, as you know, we have uh, a lot of members that work with uh, young people all over the world, and we are very well engaged in this ethical commitment. So we share with your organization this uh, common uh, uh, mandate to influence the arena and to make uh, possible to have uh, curricula that, are, uh, um, that respond to this uh, uh, requirement that you were uh, introducing. We have uh, James Carba from Liberia that is connected. I would like to mention him because uh, I know that uh, he does a very important work with youngsters in Liberia in his work uh, uh, teaching in, in, uh, in mechanic sector. Um, so now uh, we are just a little bit, 10 minutes in delay. I 
think we will be able to uh, adapt the program to the new situation. Thank you, Giovanna. I'm going to pass to the next uh, speaker, and uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce uh, um, uh, to the stage uh, uh, Professor Urz Haunstein, that is the, uh, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, Urz, is the uh, president of the International Council of Education and Management and the Association of Swiss Quality Competencies and Qualification. And uh, he's one of our uh, most important uh, brains because uh, he is giving uh, a very important uh, support, uh, very valuable support to the SkillNet uh, consortium that uh, um, is the engine for the Skillman Alliance that include uh, AR, IVETA, and uh, uh, EAPRIL, and uh, uh, that is uh, driving on this uh, uh, common uh, um, common work uh, to define uh, the skills for the future and the global COVID and to give to the global COVID uh, uh, network uh, the, the sources to uh, deploy um, the activity to improve the excellence in Tibet. This is uh, something within the Skillman and uh, SkillNet consortium uh, uh, activities. Thank you very much to be here, Urs. Uh, the floor is yours. You have uh, 12 minutes that was expected. And uh, please go on. Many thanks, Giovanni, uh, Giovanni and uh, uh, for the honors and for the, for the uh, starting words. I want to go very quick through the presentation because I have at the end uh, really uh, something uh, like a dessert. Uh, a video from the World Economic Forum, which I really want to recommend that we are looking at it together. Sorry to start, but I'm starting with a reminder. Uh, we are normally not speaking about that, but this is the past of our education in the world. We had a very bad past of education, a regime of fear. Next. And... Uh, Next slide, please. Yes. And we still have nowadays difficult situations in schools on all levels, unhappy school impressions. We know them. And that is, of course, not that what we want to have. It is not supporting learning, sustainable learning. Next, please. And as well, this maybe you think this is a normal assessment situation. But it is not. We are not looking for learning by heart, where the students are isolated. Students should work together even in an assessment phase and could learn even in an assessment phase. And the competencies are the goal and not the isolation and the marks. So please, next. This situation, we know it. <laughs> the, the, the young man is cheating at the test, but why he's cheating at the test? Because maybe the results who are needed in the test are learning by heart results. That means not content we are looking for. And the, and the, and the girl, the neighbor girl, is not giving him access to her results. But it could be a, a beautiful uh, going together and writing the test together and learning from each other and really having competencies. Next. So uh, we are in a, in a world, in a very difficult world of disruptions. We all know maybe only the digitization disruption that will cost jobs and the pandemic where we are in who is limiting us. But look on this situation. We had as well in the past serious time of disruptions and difficulties who have changed our goals and we will do and we will go as well through the next hundred years through various disruptions. So it is important to learn to handle disruptions. 
and to go through this difficult minefield as well for the future. Next. So at the moment, we are still in the final phase of the Bologna. Uh, to remember, I'm, I, 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 I'm allowed to say so because I was one of the experts uh, in Europe for the Bologna process. <laughs> uh, we initiated 98, 99, then started in 2000, that 10 years window of European higher education area, the goal outcome oriented learning, new learning, new learning outcomes. <laughs> At 2010, we found out nobody is there where we should. So we said, yes, let's create a follow up phase, five again, five, five, Five years again, 2015, we found out we are not there. Uh, okay, then we had the second follow-up phase. Now we are in 2020 uh, uh, collecting the results in a direction of outcome-oriented learning, but still not have everywhere done that, what it was initiated learning. And we said, we want to open and widen the possibilities of competencies, of learning from outcomes. The idea was, of course, uh, a very practical idea of Europe uh, to have more, more workers in the European Union and abroad, and, and uh, therefore to help them to, to, uh, to polish their competencies. But you can see this. I have created this uh, competency pro, uh, propeller some years ago. You can see in the past, we had only the red, uh, the red field of learning, the formal learning. Now it was the aim to get the blue and green field in addition. That means we have widened our field and our possibilities with non-formal, informal, and even incidental learning. That means learning per hazard, which we are doing every day. So next. So competencies, qualifications, you know this field, this is our work now, next. Next. So the idea is holistic competences. And that means, uh, uh, to describe very good, with aptitudes. That means competences are a combination of knowledge, skills, understanding, values, attitudes, desire, and many more. Many thanks. Next. And we have the situation an individual has to make a, a connection to an institution. Next. And he has to make an interview for this. Next. And he has to deliver an application letter, a CV, and maybe with this uh, credential evaluation. There are competency standards. We can create a portfolio of this, of his learning outcomes. Next. And we have to develop the portfolio and to assess the portfolio. And there are already standards of prior learning assessment and recognition in the world. Next. Yes, next. So we have the framework of target groups who need special individual support, youth, women, mature learners, disabled people, immigrants, refugees. These are the groups where we should support more, but we all other need as well. Next. So we don't have to speak only about digital, digitization, or I say it correct, digitalization, digitization, digital transformation. Uh, we need to speak as well about other fields where we have uh, now results, maybe the neuroscience, who has found out that there is a left, a right brain, that we could work with both sides of the brain, that we could implement that in the content of schools and to learn more substantial, sustainable. Next. So we know the pedagogy. We know the, the, the education for the elderly people or for the mature people, the andragogy, okay. But we know as well, maybe not yet, the eutagogy. The eutagogy is an approach 
who gives us the possibility that the learner is defining the methods and the contents of everything. And that is, of course, very sustainable. Uh, and uh, especially for, for, uh, for uh, vet people, uh, for the TVET field and for elderly persons or mature learners, a very good approach. Next. We heard about uh, the learning in, in, in the digitalization phase. We, hold, uh, we, we know that we are remote oriented. So micro learning and social learning in a combination is very interesting for us and for the future. Next. And of course, we all want to have the SDGs resolved the sustainable development goals who have a whole governmental approach, a holistic approach is needed for this. Next. That means when you're going and creating new curricula, uh, uh, I'm sitting uh, uh, with Dr. Julian as well in a, in a research project of, of advanced uh, 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 learning of new approaches of learning. So uh, then we has to make a, a, a creativity uh, approach. We has to create innovation and we then has to make the realization. So we has to redesign the curricula holistically. Next. So in fact is that we are going from industry 4.0 in a direction of humanity 5.0. That means it is not the situation and the case that all, all jobs are reduced or that we have to learn everywhere the digital uh, pathways. We have as well to look for the humane possibilities. Next. Please have a look to this video. this fear that the fourth industrial revolution means that we all need to develop only technology oriented skills or only highly scientific skills. In fact, the opposite is true. Some of the biggest rising skills of the next years are going to be creativity, collaboration, interpersonal dynamics between people, teamwork, um, specialized sales roles, HR related roles, care related roles, education related roles. These are all things that are actually at the forefront of how people relate to each other. We will need to deploy technology across all of that, but it's going to mean a combination of being digital, but also being very human. that have to change if we want to get this right. One is the policy agenda. Governments will need to start focusing on creating pathways to social mobility. That means thinking differently and spending differently on health, spending differently on education, ensuring there are fairer wages, ensuring there are better working conditions, and ensuring that there are lifelong learning systems in place. The second element is what business can do. And that is where business and government working together is best place to deliver um, on lifelong learning, on reskilling, on upskilling, and ensuring that people are getting redeployed to better jobs. And that is why we are launching the Reskilling Revolution platform. It's simply 
simply cannot be left up to each individual to figure out how to do this on weekends or in the evenings. This has to become a core part of how people learn in the workplace. It has to become a core part of how people learn, for example, through community centers. And so what we're trying to do is set up the systems to enable that, make that much more efficient, make some of those services available. So all of the online learning and training providers coming together with the offline learning and training providers coming together, aligning on what are the taxonomy of skills that they're going to be offering, what are the common certifications they're going to be offering, and making that available to everybody in a one-stop shop so people don't have to be searching for this on their own. If you want to learn more, go to reskillingrevolution2030.org. Many thanks. Next. Good. Uh, Urs, we are in a big delay now. Yeah, I have only one slide. Uh, my recommendation, go to the CDFOP uh, studies as well from this year, like the video uh, about reskilling and upskilling, and go to the uh, Future of Jobs report from the World Economic Forum with the Boston Consulting Group. Thanks. That's it. At the last slide are only references, but I'm very happy that we could see that because this is the boost of the world at the moment. Many thanks. Thank you very much Eudes, for the uh, very inspirational uh, presentation with the heotagogy and the outcome oriented learning that you reminded is at the base of our uh, approach, uh, competence-based learning and uh, uh, Bologna process uh, and the academic uh, um, environment has to uh, come closer to the Tibet uh, uh, approach. The creativity, innovation and realization that you introduced is something that uh, is all, always uh, mentioned as necessary in our curriculum uh, design processes. Uh, you remembered uh, to me something that uh, was presented by Mariek about the risk of automation that was uh, an indicator of the OSD uh, researches. And so it is uh, something that we have to discuss, taking in mind what Giovanna was uh, remarking to us, the need of the uh, of the to, to have a more inclusive education, considering even the, um, the, the situations of, uh, um, uh, of youngsters that have not the same chances to others, to the others. Uh, now, so we are moving to the next uh, uh, speaker that uh, is going to close uh, this uh, session on uh, 21st century skills. <coughs> I invite uh, to the floor my <coughs> good friend Ilze Bulgina. Uh, she's uh, um, um, she, uh, Ilze uh, Bulgina works at the Ministry of uh, Education in uh, Latvia, and uh, she is involved in several researches and uh, activities for the Ministry. She is also one of our uh, uh, pillars uh, representing uh, uh, as a member of Skillman, and she worked also to draft the Riga conclusion. So she has a very effective role in uh, uh, the policy, um, European policy arena. And uh, uh, thank you very much to be here, Ilze. Uh, she will talk about uh, uh, joint approaches, joint approaches in competence uh, uh, development in Europe. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. I'm very happy and pleased to be able to present here today. And it was interesting to listen to the previous speaker about the challenges of the European higher education area. And when talking about the Baltic experience, I will also touch upon the new EU priority, the European education area of the Bosnian Book Declaration, which should also be quite a challenge. But I will speak about the Baltic approaches in competence development. Next slide, please. 
So our Baltic cooperation became intensified in 2015, and we decided to concentrate on two Riga conclusions priorities, number one and five, to promote work-based learning and also to promote training of trainers for work-based learning. And a little bit running ahead of events in my presentation, I'm putting, I'm putting a question. Can joint Baltic region approaches in VET contribute also to the developments in broader European perspective? And uh, is it a way forward from Riga to Osnabrück? Next, please. Looking back, even though we had the Baltic cooperation before, uh, the focus on VET started really with 2015 when we uh, established the Baltic Alliance for Apprenticeships within uh, the Latvian presidency of the EU Council. And immediately we started working on Erasmus Plus projects. First of all, we established in the Baltics joint approaches for work-based learning and further on joint approaches for training of trainers in work-based learning. And also a little bit running ahead of the results, I would like to say that these two projects had already a spin-off effect in Europe and beyond. Next, please. Uh, this is the logo of uh, our project, which really made a breakthrough, not only in the Baltic cooperation, but also at European level. Mm, just a small detail. In this project, we aimed at, and it, we achieved the result, the training of uh, 800 work-based learning tutors from schools and companies, according, according to the same methodology, we called it tandem training, where uh, teachers and trainers from schools and companies are uh, trained physically together, a little bit quarreling sometimes who is better and who is more important, and finally agreeing on the positive best possible ways how to deal with the young generation and what are the competences needed. And uh, you could imagine the challenge, even for this, such a small thing, developing a joint competence profile for the Baltic tutors took almost a year, but finally the ministries agreed. And this is not just a paper, it's really a precondition for increased Baltic cooperation and mobilities and joint programs in the future. Next, please. Uh, just uh, to show uh, how our competence profile looks like one page paper. It's like a mini standard, but it defines the skills and uh, knowledge and uh, additional attitudes and, and, and real the competence of the Baltic vet tutors. And uh, it's a great pleasure and a great achievement that all our Baltic work-based learning tutors uh, work according to the same principles and it means it is the same quality and we can uh, ensure exchange of students and also teachers and trainers in the Baltics, knowing that in the other Baltic country, the quality and approach will be generally much the same. Next, please. Then uh, coming to the spin-off effects. First of all, the policy context. Uh, the, the, the web developments started very intensively also with the Berlin Memorandum of 2012 about cooperation with that. Then, of course, it was the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, then it's our Baltic Alliance for Apprenticeships, and this coming European education area, which, as I mentioned, is one of the big priorities of the Osnabrück Declaration. Next, please. Then the spin-off effect uh, also regarding policy practices and dissemination. Early this year in, uh, or just late, uh, previous year, 2019, we disseminated our Baltic experience developments in the Berlin Memorandum platform countries. You can see it was Germany, Portugal, Greece, Italy. There is also Slovakia, but unfortunately couldn't participate. And all these countries saw it a good opportunity how to develop a regional common approach because it is really a challenge in all over Europe. 
Then we are closely collaborating with the German Baltic Chamber of Commerce and doing joint projects. Then, of course, we've been disseminating our uh, Baltic uh, uh, cooperation results in European Commission events, in CEDEFOP, in Refernet networks. And uh, currently, there is a new ETF project where our Latvian uh, association of vet institutions, but also in collaboration with Lithuania and Estonia, we are promoting Latvian experience and Baltic experience to the ETF countries not only to ETF countries, but also to these specific formats as Eastern Partnership countries and also the Central Asia platform countries where it is met with quite big interest, I should say. Next slide, please. And now going more specifically to certain skills developments, because our assumption is if you manage to uh, reach some joint approaches regarding skills and competence development in one smaller scale, in this case in the Baltics, there is a good hope that maybe this can be not only disseminated, but also taken as a good practice beyond our Baltic region and maybe for clusters of countries somewhere else in Europe, having maybe the same background and being able to promote such small developments on their scale. And currently we in the Baltics are working on individualized approach and work-based learning again, common approaches, but then which might be more interesting for the present audience today, it is a challenging project skills for the Baltic food industry. And it is uh, an ambition to develop a 10 module EQF level five program where the three Baltic countries and Germany participate and these modules are currently be being developed and are translated into English so it will be not only available in the Baltic countries and Germany but also if there is interest also in broader context so it's really competence development in, 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 a, sim in a joint way. And now comes another project which is running now. It's Industry 4.0 Challenge, empowering metal workers for smart factories of the future. It's Baltic Association of Metal Works and Wet Institutions. And we are also very proud about this project because really we are looking at smart uh, solutions, joint approaches in the Baltics. And in other projects, it's Finnish Latvian, not all the Baltics, it's about uh, logistics industry, which we think is a future uh, profession. It will not disappear because any sector will need logistics. And now we are looking for broader networks. Of course, now we are into the Skillman network, which we see as a fantastic possibility to promote our industries and, and the joint competence development. Of course, various associations in Europe and maybe beyond. So we are promoting our Baltic experience now also further on in broader networks. Next, please. And uh, to finalize my presentation in a nutshell, here and again, you can see our Baltic Alliance for Apprenticeships, which we are using as a platform for joint Baltic work-based learning, but also web developments. You can see also our uh, logo, which we love very much because of its symbolism. You can see the Baltic coast. You can see implicitly our three flags. And you can see also the symbol of education, the, the books if you look closely. So we would like to dare to say that the Baltic developments are contributing to the development of the education area uh, promoted by the Osnabrück Declaration. And the Baltic uh, Consortium has allowed us to test various approaches at a smaller regional level. For example, like development of joint curricula, joint qualifications, as I mentioned in wooden industry and logistics, and also piloting modular approach for EQF qualifications, which are very much in demand. As previous speakers mentioned, these higher vet qualifications are becoming more and more important. Then are broader implications for transnational policy developments as best practice transfer to dissemination in EU and beyond, which is also increasing the European competitiveness. 
And uh, it's really in our understanding, contributing slightly, but still contributing towards the Osnabrück priority number four, European education area and also international VET. And I would like to finalize with my two slides, which are not text slides, but just pictures. And I'll explain a little bit why. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, one of our promotional materials, which we developed in 2000, I think 16 or 17, when um, trying to engage all stakeholders, uh, stakeholders in work-based learning promotion, because it took some time in the Baltics, it's something new, it's not like in Germany or Austria, which, which is hundred, hundreds of years experience. And you can see the symbolism, this climbing of the ladders, it's individual pathway, it's your own mood in your own type of boots or shoes, it's your choice, what you are choosing, but you are trying to move according to your Space, possibilities and to the top of your possibilities. So it's the slogan of inclusive excellence because excellence for e each of us is maybe something different, but it's still you are doing your best. And the next final slide, please. Just to remind you once again, our Baltic Alliance for Apprenticeships, which we believe in very much and hope it will continue to be a platform for testing new innovative approaches, which may become mainstream in our Baltic countries and maybe further beyond um, Baltics and also maybe beyond Europe. Thank you very much. That is my presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks so much Ilse, for, for the uh, very uh, inspirational uh, um, approach uh, to the work-based learning, uh, uh, even if uh, it's a um, new age for Baltic countries, you show how you are really connected with the European policies. You have uh, power also to influence and to make us feeling that uh, we are going in the same direction. And uh, of course that we are interested as a schema network uh, to uh, make this collaboration even more stronger with the uh, Baltic Alliance for Apprenticeship.